Well, I've got a confession to make right at the start. I'm one of those dangerous liberal academics you've heard about. <laughs> I compost, I drink craft beer, and I drive a Prius. <laughs> and I don't do them all at the same time. So that's why I was a little disturbed when several years ago, I became the darling of the uh, climate deniers. Some colleagues and myself published a paper and we showed that more of Antarctica was cooling than warming over a certain period of time. Well, the, uh, the right-wing pundits, the next day, they picked this up as evidence that global warming wasn't happening, that it was bogus, it was a hoax. And it clearly was not evidence of that. But this went on for quite some time. I had to let a lot of this wash off me for a long time. But there's one story, actually, several years after this paper came out, it just kept going and going. This one story that really pissed me off, and it was this one. According to University of Illinois climatologist Peter Dorn, the unexpected colder climate in Antarctica may possibly be signaling a lessening of the current global warming cycle. Okay, I never said this. I never, <laughs> I never said anything close to this in my life or even thought it. Okay, but here it was in quotes attributed to me in this paper, the Coeur d'Alene Press, June 25, 2006. And this was the tip of the iceberg. This, this got me going. I had to do something. Uh, and what? So I could publish in the academic journals, but these people don't read the academic journals. Um, so I decided I had to do something in the popular press. So I put together an op-ed and uh, sent it off to the New York Times. And to my delight and surprise, it was actually picked up and published. And it ran um, in uh, July of 2006. I remember the day that it was running. You know, on the New York Times webpage, they have that bar on the right that says the most popular stories of the day. And my little op-ed was the top story of the day, except for one article on bacteria and yoga mats. <laughs> so, <laughs> yoga mats. <laughs> but, you know, I think it helped in correcting the story. It, it really uh, sort of got the, the record out there. We, uh, I wrote about what our paper actually said and how it should be interpreted. But this really started something in me. It got Got, you know, I smelt blood. I, I wanted to continue this fight of dis, dis, against disinformation. Um, and so I started thinking, what can I do? What can I do? You know, and it's uncomfortable for scientists to get involved very publicly in uh, politics. So, for instance, a senior colleague of mine, when I started teaching, saying, you know, you can't talk about politics in the classroom. And I was thinking, well, I teach earth science. Earth science covers climate change, covers um, evolution, covers energy resources. All of these things are very much scientific, but they become political footballs. And so you have to teach them in the classroom, but there's a fine line. So I take a different approach. I do the disclaimer. You know, so the start of my class, I'll come in and I'll say, hi there, my name's Peter. I'm a liberal, I'm a liberal thinker. Um, most academics are that way. I can't explain why that is. It's just something that happens after we assemble all the facts and we think about it for a while. I'm bound to say some political things. I welcome debate, open discussion. It's all fair game. You know, and the students usually accept this. They're good with it. Then again, I'm the one that's assigning the grades. <laughs> so my, my students are mostly millennials, and I think it's important to teach them how to fight these climate deniers themselves for their, for their future. Um, it's easy to fight the climate deniers, by the way. They have about five arguments. They keep recycling them, and uh, they don't change over the years. And I often couch this to them as, you know, you're having Thanksgiving dinner and you're going to get in that argument with Crazy Uncle Bob about global warming, right? And Crazy Uncle Bob is parading out climate denier argument number six, right? Climate change is natural. It's been changing for millions of years. This is an easy one. Think about that for a while. Bob, how do you know that climate change has been happening for millions of years? Oh, scientists told you that, right? We were the ones who collected the data to show that climate's been changing for millions of years. In fact, that's a field of science called paleoclimatology. That data, or those data, are used in climate models to predict the future. So we know this very well, we told you. So don't try and throw it back in our face. Not a good argument, Bob. <laughs> a little while after um, that paper came out, and I, I started doing this with my class, um, I saw a statistic that uh, Americans, about 57% of Americans believe that global warming is caused by humans. It's a very low number. Um, and I wondered how my, my first year students would, would answer the same question. 
So I decided to pull them. I did it in the first uh, week of classes, so I hadn't had a chance to flute their brains yet. And um, it was totally anonymous. They could answer how they wanted. And this is how the answers came out. I asked two questions. One, do you believe that on average the globe has been undergoing warming in recent time? Two, do you believe humans have anything to do with this? Their answers here. So the, the students actually uh, answered about 95% believe that humans have something to do with global warming. Very high compared to the general public. This is a good start. Even uh, later, I looked at a statistic about uh, how few Americans think that, um, that there's a consensus among scientists on global warming. General public thinks that there's only about, that there's a very, uh, there's a very small um, consensus, and I knew this was wrong, okay? And so I thought, well, maybe I, can, maybe I can survey climate scientists and figure this out for myself. So I decided to, um, to, to build a survey and send it out to earth scientists, but the problem was, where do you get the database? You know, professional organizations don't generally just send out their mailing list of, of members so you can send an email blast. So we had to make our own, and there's no digital copy of a mailing list, so we had to cut the spline off this directory, a 400-page directory. We had to feed it through a scanner, then we had to use optical character recognition to build our own email list. And out of that, we got about 10,000 names of Earth scientists around the world we could send an email questionnaire to, or a link to a questionnaire. Uh, and we did that, and we got about 3,000 responses back, which is huge for a survey like that. You know, 3,000 out of 10,000. Uh, it was an online survey, as I said, and, and you needed the password to, uh, to do it, and so you could only do, do it once, you couldn't double dip. Uh, so the numbers are pretty good, and what it showed was, we asked a number of questions, but the one I'm showing you here is, uh, do you think human activity is a significant contributing factor in changing mean global temperatures? So on this chart here, this is as complex as I'm, as I'm gonna get with my data, we've got six bars, okay, don't be scared. Uh, on the far left here is how the general public would answer this question based on the, the poll I mentioned earlier. And then you have two here that I'm going to point out. Basically, we go from, from less experience to more experience with, or, or credibility of the scientists to answer this question. So on the far left are Earth scientists. They're self-identifying themselves not as climatologists. They're non-climatologists, and they don't publish. They're not active researchers. Then on the far right are, is our most expert group, they're climatologists who are active publishers on climate change. And everything in between here is some gradation between there. Basically what the results showed was the more that you understand about climate change, the more expert you are in the field of climate change, the more likely you're to answer positively to question two, that humans are causing that impact. Okay? So there's a clear consensus, at least according to our results. Our results were picked apart. I think there are some people out there that just did not like the answer. Um, but there's been two other studies since ours came out that agreed uh, very closely to what our, our data showed. One was by a group at, Stan at Stanford. They looked at uh, about 1,400 climate researchers in their publication, citation data, and inclusion in policy statements. And they showed that 97 to 98% of the climate researchers most actively publishing in the, in the field support the tenets of anthropogenic climate change outlined by the IPCC. Okay, 97, 98%, we were 98%, so they're pretty close, about the same conclusion. And then just last year, Cook et al., uh, they looked at about 12,000 climate abstracts over a 20-year period, matching the search topics, global climate change or global warming, and they showed that among abstracts expressing a position on anthropogenic global warming, 97.1% endorsed the consensus position that humans are causing global warming. All right, so 97%. We're all around 97, 98% scientists agreeing that there is uh, a human impact of global warming. So I would say enough, clearly, there's a strong consensus among scientists that, that warming's happening. I knew that already, we all knew that. You know, we, we're in the business, we talk to each other, I know that there's a strong consensus and the, the studies have shown this to be true. The interesting question though is why, what's that small percentage all about? There are a few detractors. And these are people, they have PhDs, they, they're, they're geologists or they're scientists, they have, they have degrees where they can offer opinion on this. Um, the answer to this is there's always, in a paradigm shift, there's always going to be detractors. So one of the best examples is plate tectonics. You know, the theory that there's subduction, there's mountain building in the mid-ocean ridge, there's continents moving around. Well, that wasn't introduced too long ago, but there was a, a group of very uh, well-known geologists that doubted that for a long time. 
And it actually took them to go to their grave before there was 100% acceptance of plate tectonics theory. Now everyone believes it, but the last detractor only died about 10 years ago. Okay, so, but now there's 100% buy-in. So maybe with, global, with climate change, it's the same thing. We need a generational shift in order to get 100% buy-in. <laughs> All right, so there's a strong consensus, but just like a month ago, there was a, a study came out that showed that now only one in four Americans know that there's a scientific consensus about human-caused global warming. So what are we doing wrong? Why is there this big difference between what the, what the scientists know, what the experts know, and what the public thinks? I say there's two things. First is the popular press. You know, the popular press always wants to offer balance in the story. They're going to talk to a scientist about global warming, they're going to talk to some detractor about the other side, whatever that is, right? But we know that there is no balance, okay? There's clearly not a balance. The second one is these small dissenting voices are amplified by loud voices in the right-wing media. So you know who they are, right? They have radio shows, they have TV shows, they write so many books, you know, but they are loud. Well, let's call them the big red dogs, okay? Um, so maybe this second one is an opportunity. We can use that amplified voice. Here's my idea. What we need to do is we need to change the mind of one of those big voices, right? If we can change the mind of one of those big voices, they have millions of followers. If we can change the minds of millions of followers, then maybe we can change politicians who go along with their constituents, okay? So, how do we do that? Former astronaut Frank White uh, coined this term, the overview effect. And the overview effect is an effect you get when you leave Earth and you go out into space and you look back at Earth and you see it in perspective, this small marble against the vastness of space. And one of the things, and, and those astronauts will come back changed people. It actually changes their perception of Earth. They become more environmental, most of them. The other thing they notice, and they comment often, is how thin the atmosphere is and how fragile it is. All of life is living in that little thin envelope around this big planet. It's very delicate, very fragile. Compare that to Earth, looking up, standing on the ground, looking up in your, uh, into the sky and you see the vastness of the blue sky, you can't see the end of it, right? And how can you possibly change this, right? It's, it's huge, how could you possibly change it? Looking from space though, again, a very different perspective, okay? You're looking back, you see this tiny, thin atmosphere. Seems like it's very possible that we could impact that atmosphere. So, maybe some of you are seeing where I'm going. How do we, how do we change the minds of those big voices? I think it's obvious. We send them to space. <laughs> Okay, and I'm talking about bringing them back too, right? <laughs> but if we can send one or all three of these people to space, <laughs> maybe they'll get that overview effect and it will change their mind, okay? If we change their mind, they talk about it to their listeners or their readers or whatever, we can change possibly millions of minds and we can impact politicians who might enact action, okay? So we're, we, we're gonna send them to space. Um, how do we do that? Well, no, we're gonna bring them back. <laughs> this is our guy, okay? Sir Richard Branson, his company, Virgin Galactic, is very close to sending paying, paying customers, customers out to space. So, Sir Richard also is an avid environmentalist, and he would probably get behind this. So my plea is for Richard Branson to call me so we can get this going. Uh, I think we could couch this with an, an education program for climate change, because these people obviously don't know uh, what they're talking about. And I would also volunteer to be the escort to go along in this mission. <laughs> All right? So that's my idea. All right, thank you very much.